Te invitando a las personas, sí. no, no empiezo todavía, pero simplemente pues, este, porque tenemos que primero también compartir la pantalla. Así que por ahora, pues, simplemente hablar en inglés. Buenas noches, bienvenidos a todos. Eso. Ya está. Well, hello everyone. Good night and welcome to tonight's observation night. Thanks for joining. Thank you for being here. And we should be starting shortly. Yeah, saying hi. Hello. Hi, hello, how are you? Uh, Welcome. Or I guess I should say hola. <laughs> hola, welcome. <laughs> In about like two more minutes, we'll start. We'll allow people to kind of trickle in next couple of minutes and then, so hopefully very soon we'll be we'll be starting the stream so thank you everyone for joining us um yeah, so get get comfy and we're, <laughs> we're glad you through an exciting night hopefully thank you for joining us
Okay, so we're just gonna wait one more minute and then we'll get started. Thanks for waiting. We'll be with you in one sec. Bueno, antes de empezar, un saludito Maritza, a mamá. Gracias por conectarte. Thank you for joining us tonight. Is the audio okay for those of us who are connected? Can you hear us all right before we get started? Okay. Hi guys, um, just checking if you all can hear us, if you can answer in the chat, that will be great. So we can go ahead and start. Okay. All right, perfect. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to get started now. <laughs> uh, hello, everyone, and welcome. Well, welcome and thanks for coming to tonight's observation night. Um, my name's Leonie, and I'm one of the students participating in the Hispanic Speaker Series here at the um, observatory. Um, I'm an art and art history major here at CU, um, currently in my junior year, exciting times. <laughs> I'm originally from Nicaragua, um, in case you need a little help locating me, I put a little map on the screen. Might I ask you, where in yes. Nicaragua are you from? Oh, that's a great question. <laughs> I'm from Leon, but I grew up in Managua, so... We can just say I'm from Manawa. <laughs> oh, that's good. So the capital. <laughs> yeah, the capital. So right there, the little red spot. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna claim I'm from Manawa. <laughs> I actually recently moved to Boulder, so I'm excited to be here. Um, I became interested in the multiculturalism of the observatory program because I wanted to help make this observation night a little bit more accessible for the Hispanic community um, that I obviously belong to. Um, and I also wanted to make astronomy like a little bit less intimidating than it sounds. <laughs> um, and yeah, I'm happy to be here and I hope you enjoy tonight's subject. Thank you. 
Okay, so tonight's presentation is called Art in the Starts. Um, being an art major, I wanted to find a way to link art and astronomy together um, because even though we don't think about it often, um, they actually have a lot to do with each other. And just looking back at like Latin American art history, we have so many civilizations and empires whose art and culture revolved around like the sky and like the celestial bodies. Um, so going off that, um, today we'll be exploring a little bit of the relationship between like art and astronomy in pre-Columbian Mesoamerican civilizations. Um, some of the astronomical like discoveries that were made back then um, that are still relevant today, as well as observing some of the most important objects for the civilizations. Um, so we'll be focusing on only Mesoamerica during pre-Columbian times, but more specifically on the Mayan empire. Um, there are like obviously other civilizations and empires that made huge contributions to the to astronomy, um, but we're just focusing on the Maya tonight. Just to be clear, um, more, specific, more specifically uh, on the late classic and like post-classic period, uh, which would be from like the 600 to like 1500 AD, um, if you know your like art history. And <laughs> these are the last two periods that came right before um, colonization and everything. That's um, for the rest of us. That's for, <laughs> for, the, no, <laughs> for me too. <laughs> um, yeah, so we have more of an idea. Um, of when all of this happened. Um, here's a modern day map of, um, well, of America and what you see highlighted in like dark orange would be where um, the Maya were like located back then, um, which would be modern day like Southern Mexico, Guatemala, Belize, and Western Honduras, I believe. <laughs> and yeah. <laughs> so to start off, I can give you like a little bit of a rundown on like who the Maya were. Um, they were like one of the most important indigenous like societies of Mesoamerica. Um, they were very well they they were very well established like geographically, um, which is which is why like they, I guess like lasted for so long like they were not like invaded by like any other like civilizations and we got to like obtain like a lot of like evidence from them. Um, they were super religious. Um, they worshipped like their gods um, that were related to nature such as such as the god of sun or like the goddess of moon um and they guided um they guided this guided by this like relig religious rituals is that they made some of the most significant significant like advances in math and astronomy like for example like their calendar system um and another thing is that one of the big things that they were most that they're probably most known for nowadays are like their big pyramids which were also built in alignment to like celestial bodies which is also pretty cool and we'll go more in depth about that later um so jumping into like the maya and astronomy um out of like all the world's asian calendar systems, the Mayans and like, um, I, I, I guess they were the most complex and accurate that we have out there. Um, they developed two calendars, um, but one of them, which is the one picture here, um, it was called the long count calendar and it had inscriptions that provided like information about the current lunar phase, which is very cool considering they didn't have any telescopes and everything was just, you know, looked at with a naked eye. 
Um, so the Maya astronomer slash priest at the time were the ones that like looked to the heavens for guidance um, and they used the observatories um, and like shadow casting devices to observe and like calculate, record information. Um, this information was recorded in this sort of books called codices. Um, most of them were destroyed back then, but thankfully we were able to preserve some. Um, one of the most, um, I guess, important ones, would, like for at least for tonight's subject, would be the Dresden Codex that contains sections dedicated to astronomy and information about like eclipses and like the Venus cycles, which they basically discovered back then. Yeah. I think one very important thing to just mention is the, the, the just the importance of, of codices because um, in terms of understanding a lot of the culture and what happened in the world before um, the Western civilization came to the Americas, uh, this is you know how we have insight of what was happening. Um, for a lot of other cultures that might have had important contributions around the region, we really don't know that much because we don't have any record of you know what they were thinking at the time and what they were doing. So this is a very important thing. Yeah, they had a very advanced like hieroglyphic system too, which like allows us to actually know what they were writing down and um, communicating. Um, going forward to astronomy and architecture. Um, as I mentioned before, they were recognized for their temples and palaces. Um, in their cities, like ceremonial buildings were precisely aligned with um, compass directions um, at the spring and fall, like equinoxes, for example, like the sun might be made to cast its rays through small openings in the Maya Observatory, which is the one we see here called El Caracol. Um, like the sun will light up like the interior walls. Um, and architecture such as this was like also aligned with um, the appearance of like celestial bodies such as um, ladies and Venus, which we'll talk about after this. Um, <laughs> this architectural piece um, was specifically like very carefully, well, I guess it's still <laughs> specifically very yeah, carefully yeah. aligned with the motions of Venus, which is pretty cool. It's still there and that's still the case and will forever be the case, hopefully. Um, and also the staircases that we see there, um, they're facing 27.5 degrees north of west, um, out of line with the other buildings of the site. But this is actually on purpose because it is a almost perfect match um, for the northern extreme of Venus. Um, Venus most northerly position in the sky. Um, and then also a diagonal formed by the northeast and southwest corners of the building aligns with both the summer solstice sunrise and the winter solstice sunset, which is pretty cool to think about the fact that they were thinking about like every single detail when building these things. They're, they're definitely great architects. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> in that sense for sure. And then, so as I mentioned before, um, these um, architectural pieces um, were aligned with like Pleiades and Venus. So we'll jump over to Pleiades right now. And um, so before <laughs> going forward, sadly enough, at this time of the year, um, Pleiades cluster is not actually observable at this time of the night, um, specifically from here from Boulder. So we went ahead and took some pictures last Friday. So these are um, result of these. Um, so 
Okay, I did my little research and apparently it is better observed during January. Yep. So, okay, my companion said that's true, so <laughs> we'll Lisa believe the it. This is the Northern Hemisphere. Yeah, okay. Um, well, yeah, these are some pictures taken from our telescope, like Marcel said. Um, and they're also called the M45, but most commonly known as Pleiades or the Seven Sisters. Um, they're an open star cluster. Um, it contains over a thousand stars that are loosely bound by gravity, um, but it's visually dominated by a handful of its brightest members. Uh, one of these being Merope, which is on the image to the left. So right here. And we actually have another slide that will show you where that is, like seen on the actual cluster. And then like this blue, I guess, wisp that you see on like the big image in the background. Um, would be um, like the large dust particles, I guess, that are captured by the telescope. <laughs> so these this dust particles that you see here are usually called um, nebulas. Um, and that's literally just, yeah, just gas and molecules that are just scattered around. Uh, basically gravitationally bound as well from these from these stars yeah oh so i think i said Mer so merope would be the image on your right right now mm -hmm. um that's the one you see right here and then this guy on your left would be atlas which is another one of the bright stars um it has been observed since ancient times so there's no known discover um we know that the mayas were looking at it um, so there's, we have no idea who discovered if anyone did <laughs> for that matter. Um, and like another fun fact that it's located at an average distance of 445 light years from earth <laughs> in the That's constellation awesome. of Taurus. <laughs> <That's awesome. laughs> so yeah. right by. <laughs> it's very important that a lot of these objects, the reason I like why yeah, we don't really know when they were discovered, but a lot of Asian cultures used to look at it, including the Mayas, is because they're so bright. This is literally a, a group of stars, and they're so, so bright that even with your naked eye, um, you can see kind of like this, this um, cluster of stars. Which is pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. And um, this is another, like, image from the center which would be located right here you guys can see it was taken from the telescope too you can see these kind of two stars here correspond to these two bright stars, right. these stars right here in the middle as well these, yeah these were all taken last friday <laughs> <laughs> And then, um, as I mentioned before, uh, the El Caracol, which is the observatory we were talking about, was, it is, sorry, <laughs> carefully aligned with Venus. So we'll hop over to talking a little bit about Venus, yes. if that's okay. Just, I <laughs> Just one second. Right? Uh, sadly enough, this is not the best <laughs> time of the year to observe Venus as well. <laughs> Venus right now, we only get to see a little bit of it um, more during the afternoon. So right now it, it is already over our field of view from here. So again, we, we are very <laughs> grateful to, in this case, to Daniel. Um, Shout out participant. to Daniel. <laughs> Shout out to Daniel for taking this picture for us on Saturday um, from here at SVO. You still get to see it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so this was taken with the telescope and we also have a, an image um, that was taken by NASA, so you can kind of see it more closely and clearly. Um, so Venus, or as some people apparently call it, the Earth's twin, because it's pretty similar in size and structure. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to share some facts that I 
sound. <laughs> Um, so Venus has an extremely hot surface and dense and toxic atmosphere. Um, that also has to do with the fact that, um, so this like, it, this also has to do with the fact that it has this like very thick atmosphere that creates a runaway greenhouse effect, which is when a planet atmosphere contains greenhouse gas in an amount sufficient to block thermal radiation from leaving the planet, which prevents it from cooling um, and having liquid water on the surface, um, which, you know, makes it completely inhabitable <laughs> for anyone. Um, it is the second closest planet to the sun, um, or beginning at just, just 67 million miles away from the sun. Um, it rotates so slowly on its axis, um, making one day in Venus last 243 days on Earth. Um, just a little bit. <laughs> it is also permanently um, shrouded in this thick toxic clouds that we can see here. Um, there are clouds of like sulfuric acid and they're supposed to smell like rotten eggs. So that's yes, another fun fact. <laughs> never smelled sulfur, thank God. Just so you know, it smells like rotten eggs. <laughs> it doesn't smell good. Yeah. Um, it might just look like a very bright star for the human eye. Um, but for the Mayans, Venus had like tremendous significance. Um, this planet uh, was considered like the sun's twin and it was linked to the war god. Um, they, like the Mayan leaders at the time, um, used the changing positions of Venus to plan like appropriate times for raids and like battles with other like civilizations. Um, astronomers have long looked to Venus um, to understand Mayan calendars and tradition, but now, um, after taking a fresh look at the Dresden Codex, which we just mentioned before, um, it suggests that our understanding of how the Mayans track Venus for their celestial calendars may be all wrong, actually. <laughs> um, but yeah, by combining this like new reading of the text, um, some mathematic equations and field observations, um, Gerardo Aldana at the University of California, Santa Barbara, um, has simplified the way Maya scribes would have corrected their calendars. So that's another fun fact. <laughs> just, just to add to that, that um, one of the main reasons why they, they have Venus to kind of like um, change your calendars or, or correct them is because if you're just tracking the sun for to say like for a year, similar to what happens with the Gregorian calendar, where we have leap years, the solar, the trip of the earth around the sun isn't perfectly 365 days. There's like another quarter to it. Um, by looking at Venus and kind of like seeing how out of phase it was from its normal orbit, they were able to actually um, calculate, oh, kind of like correct their calendar in, ter in terms of for that um, quarter of, of a year. So they, they were able to kind of like estimate their full 365 day year or similar to what we do in the Gregorian calendar where you add a little bit of an extra year. Very important for, for, for traditions. While we're at this, I'll add that Constanza has asked in YouTube, you mentioned that um, this architecture of, um, from the El Caracol is very much aligned with, with, the, with Venus. And she was asking, what do you mean by that specifically? And yeah, if, if actually Venus moves over the sky, we, we know it kind of moves over the sky. So she was asking him, like, what, what do you mean by it? it's very much aligned with it? Um. I guess um, in this case, it would be at a certain time of the year when Venus is up in the sky, like it will align perfectly. 
with El Caracol. So not during the whole year. <laughs> so we, we see the passing of yeah. Venus's orbit just perfectly, for example, perpendicular to Yeah, to, to the observatory. <laughs> yes. Yeah, thanks for your question. That was a great one. <laughs> um and yeah kind of going also with what what the issue that we're having tonight that we can't see venus venus i found this um information about how um so you know how venus like seen from the earth it moves like in a tricky fashion <laughs> it like appears it disappears it reappears um so the greek used to call it um I know to call it. They used to believe Venus was actually two different stars because because it would reappear and disappear so often. Um, but the Mayans knew better, and they recognized Venus in both mornings and even in skies as one and the same, which is go Mayas. Go Mayas. <laughs> um, but yeah, going back to architecture. Uh, We'll go back to Chichen Itza, which is where the Caracol that we just talked about is located in this uh, city. Um, this is like one of the most famous examples of Mayan like architectural alignment with celestial bodies. Um, um, people still gather here each year um, to observe like the sun, like illuminate the stairs of the pyramid um yeah <laughs> so the pyramid itself is dedicated to Quetzalcoatl which is or was this feather serpent god um but it was also identified with uh Venus um so at the vernal and autumnal equinoxes the sun gradually illuminates the pyramid stairs and the serpent head at its base, creating this like image of a snake um, slithering down the sacred mountain to earth. So that's pretty cool that they knew how to do that. <laughs> um, in this picture, we can see Orion um, aligning like over El Castillo, um, which I thought could be a great way to segue into talking a little bit about Orion. Um, sadly, <laughs> another one that we are not able to see tonight. Oh. Orion is also just, <laughs> yeah, at this time of the year, probably Maya said both, if, if they were bolder, they would have had not a lot of fun and they would have probably not have had as many ceremonies. Um, again, it just pops out of the horizon probably closer to 11 p.m. for us, so like two hours from now. Um, but thankfully enough, we were able to get these pictures um, from previous observations <laughs> here at SBO, so <laughs> recycling material. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so the nebula, which we can see in this image on the left, is um, located in the sword of Orion, mm -hmm. hanging from his famous belt of three stars. Um, which can be seen right here. So that's the famous belt of three stars. <laughs> there we go um so what we have <laughs> is a picture of the nebula um the star cluster is embedded in the nebula um and it's visible to the human eye as just like one single star um because of its like prominence, um, a lot of cultures from all over the world have given a very special meaning to Orion. Um, the Mayans in Mesoamerica envisioned the lower portion of Orion, um, like his belt and its feet, 
um, as being the hearthstones of creation. So it was it was very important for them. They had this um, like hearthstone of creation shape in like the middle of all the households and everything. Um, the Orion Nebula is enormous. It's an enormous cloud of dust and gas. Um, here's another picture. So you can kind of see what I mean by that. <laughs> this is actually a bubble picture. So of course, it looks way pretty. <laughs> it's a glorified picture. <laughs> of course. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's an enormous cloud of dust uh, where, and gas where vast numbers of new stars are being forged. It is one of the closest sites of, uh, of star formation to Earth and therefore provides like astronomers with the best view of stellar birth in action. Um, so yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah, I'll just add that it's pretty incredible and still like very important for the study of archaeoastronomy. The fact that, you know, um, the Mayas and their myth have this object as a very important um, site of creation, if you might say. Um, and even now, like with newer technology, newer understanding of how the universe works, we have star formation sites there. Um, so it's very interesting for, for a lot of people that are studying these ancient um, cultures that the fact that there's this kind of correlation between their myth with what we've discovered now. It's a very nice coincidence. Yeah. <laughs> and then we'll go back to, to talking a little bit more about the Mayas. This is like the last part, I promise. <laughs> um, and it's going more into like astronomy and their traditions. Um, so they believe that the gods guided that the gods guided the sun and the moon across the sky. Um, even in the darkness of night, um, they believe that the sun and moon like continued to journey through through the underworld. Um, um, and that they threatened like the way they were they were threatened by this like um, celestial bodies. Um, and this is like where all the sacrifices and everything come from. Like they thought that was the way to keep these gods happy and like the sun up there, the moon up there. Um, <laughs> that would be the explanation for the terrible sacrifices, but <laughs> you know, it was part of the culture. Um, they weren't the only ones sacrificing. Yeah, they were not the only ones sacrificing people back then. <laughs> um these were like the price to pay for like the continued survival of the universe um like that's what that's what they thought at least um right here on your left is a picture of the mayan moon goddess um this is a painting from the classic period since we're talking about the classic period um her name was Ixchel, and it can be seen from like some of her features that she's clearly a goddess. Um, and this was because for the Mayas, the moon was assumed to be female and the sun was assumed to be male. So it was the god of the sun and the goddess of the moon um, being in the image of a woman. Um, the moon was also like associated with fertility and growth. Uh, so not only human beings, but also like of the vegetation and crops, um, since growth can also co cause all sorts of ailments, uh, the moon goddess is also a goddess of disease. <laughs> um, and almost everywhere in Mesoamerica, um, it was associated with water, um, since, you know, a rainy season will result in good crops. Um, and this also goes linked to the human sacrifices. They would do human sacrifices so it would rain more and they would have a successful crop season and everything's just very linked. <laughs> um, 
So we're talking about the moon. <laughs> we'll go ahead and actually get to observe the moon tonight yes. in real time. Yes. So for the first time, we're going to have a little bit of an interactive thing going on right now. <laughs> Escape. So, so the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna pull up Skynet. And what is this, Leonie? Um. So this is how we control the telescopes here. Yes. So this is our, this is our field of vision right now. So you can explain kind of like what they're seeing. There. Yeah. So what you see in this, in this, inside this like orange trace, it's what's visible for us tonight. Mm -hmm. um, so the moon just crossed, right? A little bit yeah. ago. So you can see, see it right there. Oh, so she's right here. <laughs> so, and she is it's full moon right now. You can also see a green light underneath that is actually the horizon. Um, because we're in Boulder and because we're in a building, there are obstacles that get into the way of actually seeing completely into the horizon. So mountains, trees, the actual building that we're in. So we have an even narrower field of view of the open sky um, right now. So the first thing before moving to the moon that we're going to do is actually um, show them how we calibrate the telescope. So you're going to point at Vega, which is one of our brightest stars. Right here. Yeah. You can just select Vega, um, and then slew the telescope to it. So, oh. and that's <laughs> the little the little, little telescope little moving <laughs> towards Vega. Yes. That's actually going very fast. <laughs> there we go. So now that it's pointing at Vega, and you both did not see that, you probably heard the <laughs> telescope switching. And what we're going to do is select the camera. And what we hope to do is with a camera, <laughs> well, if it decides to connect. Oh, something's happening. Yep. All that noise. There yep. we go. Okay. It's a good so, night. Yes. So what we're going to do is we're going to go into the focus tool. And actually, no, we're going to take a photo. <laughs> <laughs> I let you. One second, it's a good exposure time. No, we're actually not. We're taking a picture. Vega. You can explain what they're seeing. So it's taking the picture right now. So that's why you see just. Kind of a blur, but it's gonna start clearing up. Did you see that? It's In a few seconds. Taking, um, a, taking a bunch of pictures. Yes. So it's every one second, that's the exposure time. Every one second, it's taking another picture, another picture, another picture. And that's Vega right there. So we do have a software to do the um, actual cal calibration or, or just like the focusing of the telescope but sometimes it doesn't work properly so we're actually going to do it manually so we have this thing over here which is a diffraction grate and it's actually used to calibrate the top hopefully it doesn't fall <laughs> here's hoping my cell doesn't fall uh <laughs> Okay, that's that's taking shape. That's looking better. Still not there. Yeah. 
so that um that little like shine that we see that's an effect of the telescope right yes it's not so it's not actually there <laughs> this is actually just a diffraction pattern um from the 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 grate that we just put so as light comes in through those slits in the in the object that i just showed it creates this this pattern that light kind of just goes into from the from the star so in order to see that this object is actually um calibrated what we need is these two kind of like triangles underneath to have closely the same the same kind of um area underneath them so i'm just going to change that because So you can just. Oh, we're getting a full view into the behind the scenes yeah. of how this picture has happened. So we're going to change it up real quick. And it's very cloudy. So that is also why you see that the image is, is very, very foreign. That's good. Oh, now you can actually move it to the wall. Oh, okay. Nice. Should we minimize this yeah. for a second? Okay, yeah. so you're, we're going to stop seeing this process for a second, guys. And then we'll just show you the final result. <laughs> so we're going to look for the moon. And we're going to slew the telescope towards it. It's going from like one, one extreme to the other <laughs> <laughs> right now. There we go. Slowly but surely. <laughs> You can see how like the little yellow dot moves across the screen. It's almost there. In the meantime, if you have any questions, please go ahead of anything. The Mayas, what we're doing right <laughs> now at the telescope, <laughs> say slew. There's no <laughs> one here, but still slewing. Who said that? <laughs> <laughs> I yes, thought about yes. it. I was gonna scream slew. Yes, yes. You should have. You should have. See? <laughs> yeah, it, it is good tradition to say slew if you're here at the observatory and there's people around. Because you can hit people with a telescope. <laughs> and first, it is harmful <laughs> <That's>... <laughs> to people. And also the telescope is very expensive. So we yeah. don't want to break it on something. Hey, it back. sounds like a very questionable excuse. Like I got hit by a telescope. Um, I, don't I, know. Mean, it, I don't know how believable that sounds. Yes. So <laughs> now you can actually go ahead and take a picture of the moon. So go to camera. Mm -hmm. And I'll press the word this. Abort this. No longer want to do that. We're gonna go take a picture. And if you want, you can set a ex very low explosion time. The moon is very, very bright. You can set it as close to zero as possible. Okay, so, so be, not zero. Just a zero? Yep. Oh, zero. Yep. And just go ahead and take a picture. We'll see what it shows up. Oh, we're experimenting, I guess. <laughs> And hopefully it is already there. Such a small exposure time. Okay. So what do we see? Just <laughs> bright, bright image. Just white. Yes. So the main reason why this happens is because the moon is just so bright. It is very hard to observe. 
So what we'll actually do is, if you're observing the moon in a red filter, basically there's a lot of red, red light um, and longer wavelengths can travel through the atmosphere a lot easier. Um, so because we have a lot of red light coming in, what we're gonna do is we're gonna choose a part of the light spectrum, probably closer to blue or ultraviolet, that we hope to have less light actually being reflected out of the moon surface. So we're gonna choose you or supposed to be blue, but ultraviolet kind of, so. Yeah. Change it, so it says moving, it's ready. And we go ahead and, and try take again. another picture. And yes, Constanza, it is a great night to be looking at the moon. Yes, we have a full moon right now, so very exciting. Can you see the... <laughs> go ahead and... Oh, there we go. So, now, again, just change, uh, change a few things here, just so it's... And there you have it. This is a, a very in detail. A very close up picture of the moon. One point surface of the moon, um, <laughs> one little section of the moon. So you can let this here and you can kind of go into detail about the yeah, moon. Yeah, um, I'll throw you some fun facts about the moon as I've been doing with all the other objects. Um, the moon is actually a very small companion to Earth, um, being, I guess, in comparison about the size of a nickel. Um, if you put it like, like bias, <laughs> it's just, it's that tiny. Um, it's rotation, it's so in sync with ours that we actually never get to see the other side of the moon. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of where the Pink Floyd album <laughs> <laughs> name also comes from, I guess, <laughs> the other side of the moon. Um, I actually did not know this one until last weekend when we were here taking pictures of the moon. Um, I didn't know that the rocky surface is actually caused by, um, asteroids and, um, comets like impacting with the moon oh. surface. Oh, yes. Space. That, I don't know if that's concerning, but that's new information for me. <laughs> definitely. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> you ever seen a you haven't seen a meteor shower or oh. so yeah meteor, I, I mean it's very we, we live in a very dynamic universe uh, <laughs> yeah and even our galaxy is very dynamic our solar system so there's there's a lot of um asteroids and because the moon doesn't have a thick atmosphere like yeah we do, um these asteroids would just clash into <laughs> the yeah moon, they don't get disintegrated like they do on, like, on the atmosphere and we get to see them as as the meteor showers like completely opposite from venus it has like yeah. a very thin mm -hmm. atmosphere which also makes it inhabitable <laughs> so <laughs> very thin yeah. and very thick they're both well, inhabitable we like the same people. <laughs> yes we like the same people to just look at the moon and there, have some a, fun <laughs> there's a lot of science in, in the moon see you as pioneer of studying the moon as well and sending missions there especially here at the APS department so there's a lot of fun work to do there how do you feel about that being interested in the sun oh I, I don't mind it I, <laughs> I know that a lot of people like to be jealous because um, <laughs> you know we study the sun me and community here um, but it's very important to understand not just the solar system the sun the moon uh, but really uh, space in general it's, it's a very important thing even outside our solar system. So even yeah. though I study the sun, I, I don't take jealousy to the people that study very beautiful and, and different objects. Uh, True. That's a good way to be about it. Um, I mean, I study the best ones, so there's no... <laughs> <laughs> there's nothing there. I want to be jealous. <laughs> Just throwing it out there. <laughs> um, this is a picture of the moon that I took from my phone actually last Friday, right? Um, so from one of the telescopes here, which I thought was pretty cool. And I that I should share with you guys today because I was pretty proud yeah, <laughs> that great, I got that. <laughs> this is a very good picture. You, you can even see 
over here a lot of the um creators the creators yeah that, that now i know are created from the asteroids <laughs> <laughs> impacting the moon um and this is another picture that um marcel graciously took <laughs> on friday another close-up of the moon and you can also kind of see the texture of the surface which is pretty cool um and wrapping up on our Maya talk, um, before we go, I wanna, I wanted to just bring more attention and like recognition to a couple of um, humans that are making a contribution to astronomy um, in the modern day. Um, so linking it to my subject of like you know arts and everything. Uh, we have Dr. Brian Mendez, who was born in Michigan, but he's actually of Mexican and like um, Spanish descendants, uh, which is why we're bringing him here today. <laughs> he also has his Hispanic roots. Um, so Dr. Brian Mendez um, became interested in this space um, very early in his life from watching Star Wars. Um, which evolved more in depth, um, which evolved and like he started getting more into science, um, visiting planetariums, um, playing with telescopes and reading different books, um, such as A Brief History of Time by Stephen Hawkins. <laughs> Just a light reading for, you know, a young boy. <laughs> Uh, he graduated from um, the University of Michigan uh, with a triple degree in music, physics, and astronomy. Um, <laughs> and later on, he would continue to the University of California, Berkeley, to complete his PhD under Professor Mark Davis. Um, his thesis was to develop a technique to measure nearby galaxy distances with measurements of the luminosity of red giant stars and compare it to the theoretical predictions of how these galaxies moved. Um, after this, he started working as an educator. Um, and for more than 30 years, he has worked in the space science laboratory at the, at the UC um, Berkeley, um, developing like public outreach, creating educational resources and conducting professional development for educators. Um, some of the highlights of his work include being the education lead of NASA WISE, uh, co-leading the Navajo Skies Planetarium Show Creation, um, directing the Calendar in Sky um, professional development program for informal educators and Latin community leaders, um, and covering the Mayan Solar Senate crossing at Chichen Itza, um, so this, which, which is really cool information and it's why we have him here tonight. Um, his work expanded a lot into the fine arts. Uh, he worked as a freelance filmmaker. Um, he has directed both STEM movies slash documentaries like Full Spectrum and has recognizable work outside of STEM, um, like winning the Scary Cow Film Festival award for outstanding editing for deep water Sadly enough that that f film festival is no longer oh no <laughs> uh, because of covid sadly um, <laughs> there we go <laughs> but his work not only combines um the arts with astronomy education but it's also important to make science more accessible in the United States um, and highlight the contribution of Asian astronomers within the Americas, like the Navajo, the Aztecs. And we saw that he also uh, worked with the Mayas, which is pretty cool. So he's preserving that. Um, and then linking it more with the actual uh, multiculturalism at the observatory program that we're doing right now and making like astronomy accessible. We have uh, Dr. Wanda Diaz-Merced, uh, which is another great human 
Boricua en la casa. <ríe> Boricua, born in Gurabo, Puerto Rico. Um, she's a pioneer in making astronomy accessible to people with visual problems, and we'll go more into that about that. Um, she's an astronomer and the leading proponent of sonification um, of astrophysical data, which is representing astrophysical data with sound instead of images. And this is because she actually lost her sight in her early 20s. Um, and her dreams of studying stars and the very visually oriented scientific world um, suffer a major setback until she discovered sonification as a way to turn huge data sets into audible sound. Um, she realized that she could use her ears to detect patterns in stellar radio data and could uncover connections obscured by graphs and visual representation. Um, she received her bachelor's in physics from the University of Puerto Rico. Uh, she continued, Marcel is very happy over here. <laughs> she continued to undertake astrophysical research at NASA Space, Space Flight Center and completed a PhD in computer science at the University of Glasgow in Scotland. Um, apart from that, she has held positions at the Harvard, Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics and the South African Astronomical Observatory. Uh, she co-shared the 2019 conference, Astronomy for Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion at the National Astronomical Observatory of Japan. And most recently, she joined the European Gravitational Wave Observatory. She's a very important voice and leader in increasing equality of access to astronomy and STEM. Um, she's also a lady, which we love to see women in STEM. <laughs> so we had to throw her in here. And that is it that I have for you guys tonight. <laughs> yeah. so for everyone that joined us, thank you so much for, for being with us this night, for joining us for this exploration. Uh, Mayan astronomy and pre-Columbian times, and also highlighting the important work of Latin American astronomers in today, making science accessible to people all over the world and people um, from different backgrounds. So we thank you all. Um, if you have any more questions, any more comments, please feel free to, to chime them in. Um, but yeah, we just wanted to invite you all to next week's one. Yeah, which Spanish. will be in Spanish, with, which, you know, I might do better at. <laughs> Leone, Leone is very excited. To speak I'm Spanish very excited for the next one. Um, yeah, so if you speak Spanish, come over. <laughs> have a great time. And yeah, my very old iPhone to an iPhone 8. So I guess <laughs> in Apple, Apple's world, it's a very old iPhone, but it still works. <laughs> no, no, it works. It works. Thank you very much. We're going to close the, the chat, but feel free to comment to leave um, your questions. If you don't get to them right now, we'll get to them later. So thank you all very much. Have a good night. Thank you for being here.